welcome to my talk. I'm, I have to preface this in that um, it's not so neatly organized as Alessandro's um, talk, um, but it's more presenting what I've found so far and uh, showing you what I think of it. So discourse organization and reference tracking in Goro narratives. Um, I'll be giving a short introduction about some definitions. Then I'm going to look at the narrative structures the reference tracking, the discourse markers, and I'm gonna finish with some conclusion and a few open ends. So the introduction. Um, reference tracking, what is it? Um, in my case, it is keeping track of all the participants in a story, story using um, semantic and grammatical means. Uh, it's pretty broad, but that's what you get. Um, for an, an example of these grammatical means is uh, this accessibility hierarchy, which I'm sure you've all seen before. Um, and it shows that the more something is, uh, the more closely something is being tracked, so the more activated it is, the less uh, specific the grammatical marking needs to be to keep track of the reference. Then uh, looking at discourse organization, I'm mainly looking at the sentences and paragraphs, uh, or I have to make the distinction between those two. Uh, sentences are uh, a breath and or intonation group, and I have defined a paragraph as a cluster of utterings that are connected thematically, some tighter than others, and are linguistically marked either by a discourse organizing marker or construction and or by pauses or intonation contour. Um, so the end there overlaps, uh, the end of a paragraph overlaps obviously with the end of a sentence. And then you have narrative structures. Uh, I've taken this as broadly as possible. Uh, I'll be getting into it uh, a little bit more in a second, but it basically means uh, dividing up a full narrative into parts. So a beginning, middle and end, for example. Um, the data I have taken all from Andrew Harvey's Elar Gora Corpus. Um, I've taken the texts that have been transcribed and translated. Uh, as you can see, they are mostly narratives, but there's one instructional um, uh, video or audio and one autobiographical monologue. So the narrative structure, based on Vedekind's uh, paper on um, Cushitic narratives, um, he gives the three main parts, the introduction, the inter intermittent speaker here in context, and the conclusions, and I'll be going through each of these and uh, showing what I found in terms of uh, structure. So the introduction. Most stories, or most narratives, sorry, uh, start with what I've tentatively called an attention getter. This is something like, uh, look here, um, and it uh, indicates that the, the speaker is taking the floor and will start their narrative. Um, a, real introduction in air quotes uh, may follow um, which sets the scene of the narrative and setting the scene is giving the time the place and the content of the story so an example here is you have these are the first two lines of a narrative and in example one you see uh, the setting of the time which is in the past the setting of the place which is at the borderland in goraland and then in two, you see pretty much a very a sneak preview of what's going what's to happen in the narrative. Uh, the introduction could also be an extended personal description. In the case of the autobiographical monologue, uh, you have a full introduction of first name, surname, birth year, and birthplace. But in cases where where other characters are introduced, this could also be um, their deeds or their familiar uh, connections or their um, status, for example, as a chief. Then uh, it, the narrative can also start, which is sort of connected to the attention getter with some speaker hero interaction. Uh, for example, are you listening? Which requires a, a, um, a response of, of I am listening. Yes, I am listening. Um, so the speaker knows that uh, they can start the narrative. And the speaker here interaction continues pretty much throughout every single narrative. Um, and it works both ways. So in 4A uh, or 4A and B, you can see that the speaker um, asks, asks a question uh, requiring a, a, a full uh, verbal response. Uh, have you heard? So it's sort of a uh, uh, making sure that the hearer is still paying attention. Uh, but in 5, you can see that the listener is 
um, asking a content questions re question regarding uh, what is going on in the story. Um, and this is done by just simply stating the question when the speaker uh, pauses for a second. And this uh, occurs all throughout pretty much uh, the entire narrative. Then going on to the conclusions of a narrative, uh, there are several formulae. Uh, the most prevalent is one using the verb for to finish. Um, this is, can be done in a, a third person manner. So uh, talk of this has finished now. But uh, other variations often include some first person marking, such as um, regarding this topic, I have finished, or, or just I have finished uh, in general. Uh, something that also occurs quite often is, is a quick re recapitulation of the events and uh, giving a conclusion or sort of moral of the story. Uh, for example, here, this is the reason why the line of the Gorwa people is very small. It was the making of his evil, is pretty much. Uh, just a summary of, of or a conclusion of what has happened in, in the previous narrative. Uh, one other thing, which is the, the continuation of the speaker hero interaction we've seen throughout uh, the narrative, is that the narrative ends in a sort of Q&A session where the hearer asks some questions um, either about some of the content that isn't clear yet or about the, the source and author and thus authority of the, of the story. So. For example, here, um, the, the, the hearer sorry, is uh, interviewing the, the speaker on the authority of, their, um, of, the, of the story they have just told. Um, because of lack, uh, because there isn't that much data, it remains to be seen whether this uh, Q&A is formalized in any way and it, whether you would see like a four part interaction uh, of this kind you see in example seven in, in uh, more instances. It will be interesting to find out. Okay, moving on to reference tracking. Um, there, there's a, uh, the main, sorry, the main uh, way of tracking uh, reference is using demonstratives. It's very prevalent. It pretty much happens in almost every sentence. Then you have unmarked medial passive selectors and passive constructions. So uh, the demonstratives can be used uh, to establish reference, reference um, in a narrative, uh, for example, in eight that there's, or uh, the topic is being, uh, uh, sorry, the topic is given as uh, a, a, a day and a time. Uh, note also that this is marked with the topic marker, um, but I'll let Yurian uh, talk about that more. Uh, but it, it can also be used, uh, for example, in nine for something that is um, pretty much in an always activated state because of, for example, physical proximity. Um, here, uh, in this example, they are physically located in Yerotoni. So um, the demonstrative marker establishes the, uh, or shows that activation status. Then in regards to tracking the reference, uh, you can see in 10A, the reference is established, uh, the bull, uh, with the third demonstrative. Um, and then in B, you can see that the indefinite base is uh, suffixed with the demonstrative, um, which uh, tracks back to that bull. Um, interestingly, here you have a combination thus of an indefinite base and a definite suffixing. Um, I believe that this is this gives an individual individuative reading, meaning that um, a specific member from a set is selected and, and highlighted to, to the exclusion of under, uh, other um, underspecified uh, members of that set. Um, interestingly, however, we have a second thing being tracked uh, with a different demonstrative. Um, I'm uh, as of yet unsure what this refers to. It could be to Hamisi, Hamisi's house, or uh, it could be some sort of double uh, double marking of that uh, bull, um, but that's something I'll have to figure out. Uh, have to figure out. Now, moving on to unmarked medial passive selectors. Uh, they consist of the medial passive marker T plus an auxiliary, and they are used to uh, for a previously established and under or unspecified reference. For example, you have the Gora at that time is very obviously an, an underspecified, underspecified referent, and the uh, unmarked medial passive selector uh, marks that and uh, um, 
emphasizes that underspecified status. Moving on to the passive construction, uh, this one is uh, quite interesting. It consists of, um, well, the medial passive marker, and then in the case where the patient is a third person plural, there is always a third person agent marking as well, even if there is semantically uh, uh, or, or virtually not, uh, no agent present. Um, so you have that agent marking, then the third person plural patient marking, the auxiliary, and then uh, variable TEM marking. And you can see here in 14, uh, in line 32, the referent is established, those young men, those young men. And then in 34 and 35, you can see that they're being tracked with the same uh, form, Kiwa. And, but in uh, line 36, which is uh, directly after 35, you can see that the TAM marking changes, um, which shows that it's a, uh, it is the construction that tracks the referent and not necessarily that specific configuration of uh, that passive construction. And between line 36 and line 44, there is a, a, a space of almost 10 lines uh, in which the re those reference, those young men are not tracked. Uh, there's a little caveat uh, in the story. But then in 44, it is again tracked using that same passive construction. And uh, one could say, well, maybe that is a, a, a prophoric uh, tracking or something like that. But this uh, line 44 is the last line of a paragraph, so it, it's difficult um, to say that this is, would be a prophoric of some kind. Okay, moving on to the last topic, the discourse markers. Um, this is relatively new stuff, so I'm, I'm still uh, figuring out what it all means. There are four types, interjections, conjunctions, Swahili loans, and complex markers. And you can see in this table, that interjections are by far the uh, the most uh, there's a, the most variation in them, uh, but they are also the most uh, prevalent in the narratives. Uh, as you can see in the interjections, there are several um, different forms that are translated in the same way, such as hey or low, um, and this is because the exact scope and meaning of these markers has not necessarily been disentangled yet. You can also see that there are very few conjunctions. Um, ne, which is just and, is pretty much only used um, uh, within the sentence uh, level. It can be used uh, to conjunct, conjoin um, sorry, uh, uh, sentences as well, but that is not, it uh, doesn't seem to be its main function. And interestingly, the Swahili loans seem to be taking over some conjunctional functions, uh, if I may. Um, the uh, alafu is pretty um, pretty common and use, is used pretty much to uh, conjoin um, paragraphs together. Um, in Swahili, it is used for both uh, to conjoin both sentences and paragraphs, but uh, it seems that Gora has only taken uh, the paragraph conjunction function um, from Swahili. Um, also, um, uh, to what Alessandro said, you can see that these are probably very recent loans uh, because they have undergone virtually no phonological developments and especially Mpaka still shows that initial nasal. Then the complex constructions uh, or the complex markers, sorry, have to do mainly with uh, speaker hearer interaction, except for the first one, aluo, which consists of the base alu, which means back, and then the topic marker in air quotes. Um, but this has been fossilized probably to such a degree that it's not um, analyzed as such by speakers anymore. To finish up some conclusions I have uh, come to uh, during the research is that, um, well, an initial look at the, the um, framework for Cushitic narrative structures by Vedekind seems to map. Uh, however, of course, this, has only, uh, this was only very broad abroad and I have to look into more detail if some of the smaller uh, or lower level uh, narrative structures also map onto that framework. But that would be interesting uh, in light of uh, cross-linguistic uh, narrative structure analysis. And we can also see that there is structural influence from Swahili because these 
um, Swahili loans all fit into the conjunction paradigm, but they don't seem to be replacing any conjunction. So it seems to be a case of a, a paradigmatic suppletion rather than a replacing or, or uh, yeah, replacing. And then the loose ends are those double demonstratives. I have seen a few of them, and I haven't yet been able to determine uh, exactly what they do and what their function is. Um, and I will have to look deeper into those and see what's going on there. I obviously have to look at the exact meaning and scope of those disworth markers, um, especially regarding uh, possible TEM marking and what that does uh, to um, inhibit or promote certain discourse markers in use, or whether it's all uh, speaker preference. And then lastly, I still want to look, if I have time and space, to uh, the interaction of lower and higher scale or tier organization of discourses, of discourse, sorry, in the narratives. Uh, and see whether those, so, so for example, if the use of conjunctions influences uh, the, the structure of a paragraph, or something like that. And uh, I want to embed my findings into the information structure literature more um, because I don't think I've done so enough yet. The references, and I thank you for your time. Great. Thank you, uh, Clemens, for this uh, really interesting presentation, I think, because, uh, I mean, obviously, I, I've looked at these narratives and, and, uh, and, and, and texts, uh, but in a very different way. So it's really exciting uh, for somebody to take them and sort of examine them uh, from a different sort of, with a different sort of scope. And uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I think some of these patterns that you've come up with are, are really sort of novel to me and exciting. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's a really cool presentation, and I think clearly there's there's lots to say. Um, so thanks for that. Uh, Martin asks, uh, did you notice a narrative structure in prosody or rhythm? So in those sort of in those sort of elements that may not have made it to the the, the written form. Uh, did you notice any sort of structure that was indicated in prosody or rhythm? Well, um, uh, whenever I looked at the, or tried to uh, find uh, find out more about the meaning of a certain marker, listening to the, the intonation and, and prosody, I always found that they were heavily prosodically marked, um, especially the, uh, for example, Olafu and Aluo, uh, but let's just keep it to Olafu. Uh, whenever it's used, it's surrounded or followed by a long pause. Um, it can have a, a, a very marked a dip in intonation or a rising intonation, uh, depending on what follows. Um, but I haven't looked at it on a on a more on a larger level uh, so far. But there's definitely something there. I think. Right. Very uh, very interesting. Um, I think because. Uh, yeah, I mean, with with sort of the grammatical function of tone in uh, in both Gorwa and Iraq, actually, I think that yeah, this sort of role of intonation hasn't been looked at, uh, you know, and the prosody and rhythm hasn't been looked at in as much detail. And I think you know that's almost a whole other paper, really. I think it's very yeah, very cool. Um, Martin also asks, did you notice anything specific to certain individual narrators? Did you have any 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 speakers that you that you noticed any any particular patterns from or anything like that? Um, yeah, that's uh, I briefly uh, mentioned it regarding the um, the markers um, is that speakers, especially regarding the interjections, seem to have uh, uh, preferences for certain uh, forms. So I had one speaker uh, the the he a form. Uh, was the majority of uh, instances came from that one speaker um, mm -hmm. where other speakers preferred different uh, interjections. Um, but as I said before, this could partly be to the way they build their narratives or the way um, they have the stories, has, the story is structured, or it could be personal preference. Um, but the, all those discourse markers are um, disproportionately used by different speakers. Okay, that's uh, quite cool. So some, so perhaps some evidence for for people having and 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 exploiting their own individual narrative styles. Exactly. Very cool. 
Um, Yurian asks, does the Q&A recap also occur when there are multiple listeners? Um, well, this is uh, something I wanted to mention but forgot is that so far I only have uh, instances where there are, but there's only one listener or one listener actually participating because of course Andrew was there. Um, but sometimes you have had two speakers and one listener, uh, but never more than one listener. And it would be interesting to see how that interaction works when there are multiple listeners or even uh, a large group to which the speaker is talking. So you need you need some more data with more with more yeah. listeners than speakers. Okay. Off to Tanzania right. with you. <laughs> Please do. Um, Yurian also asks. Uh, this is a more specific question. He says on slide twenty four. Is there nothing at all preceding line 44 that might again be taken to refer to the tracked referent in 44? Um, I don't know all the lines by heart, but um, I did look at this and this is one of the first things that I, I found regarding, uh, interesting things I found regarding reference tracking, is that there was such a pause um, or such a, a gap. Um, I think the reason why we find such a large gap is because there's a little caveat um, about, um, I think, the, the weighing process or something, um, which, you know, could indicate that, uh, it could also be that, sorry, that the, the Kina in 44 um, sort of also marks the resumption of the story. But um, as far as I can remember, there isn't really any tracking in those uh, eight lines between it. Okay. Um. Yes, yeah. If I if I recall, there's a little there's a little um, digression about how you can perhaps um, how you can perhaps bribe the man at the scales. Oh yes, uh, exactly. It was a bull. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Yenika has uh, her hand up. Yes. Hi. Um, thanks for that uh, for that work and presentation, Clements. Uh, it's really really interesting. Um, I noted that you, you say, what about those double demonstratives? Um, and uh, I posted a, a paper of mine uh, that searches for the double demonstratives in Makua, uh, which no doubt were completely different uh, from uh, the ones in, uh, uh, in Borwa. Um, but it might give you some inspiration uh, for, for how to look at that. Um, and related to that, uh, what I use there is the uh, is Ariel's uh, accessibility hierarchy. Um, and you mentioned, uh, well, you know, uh, in the conclusions, um, uh, Vedekin's uh, generalization or model uh, seems to uh, work. But uh, first, it wasn't quite clear to me what that exactly, um, um, what he refers to or what is uh, specific about Gorwa here and why you wouldn't want to say to, to take it broader and say um, uh, Gorwa work exactly as we would predict from uh, a broader functional perspective or um, uh, or any other uh, mm. perspective. What do you think? About yeah, um, well that's a very good point actually. Um, uh, it, uh, I just, I mean, pretty much did that because Vedekind was focusing specifically on, on Tushitic uh, focus strategies. Um, and I wanted to see, pretty much use that as a guideline to see if, if there's some, uh, if it supports this Tushitic type focus strategy or, or the Tushitic fo focus strategies. Um, but I definitely, if I can, definitely want to uh, make it as broad as possible. Um, for the exact reasons that you gave. Um, but yeah, Vedekind is for now, or their proposal is for now just a, a guideline um, I want to use to analyze the narrative structures. Okay. Um, and uh, so Oh, and thank you for the paper, by the way. I will definitely look at it. <laughs> and Yenika says thank you in the, uh, in the chat. Um, Liz Kerr asks, are there conversations in the subcorpus between adults only or also children? I'm thinking about the possible influence on speaker-hearer interaction or question-answer structure and moral lessons. Well, yes. Uh, well, children, no. Um, but in all those conversational narratives, it's definitely a sort of um, teacher-student type situation where the 
the hearer is a younger person and, and um, they ask about a tree or something and then a, um, a story is told. Um, and I'm also thinking about the B instructional narrative. I know there are children present there, but I, um, I'm, I haven't looked at their specific interaction um, so far. But uh, so yes and no. <laughs> right. Uh, Martin asks, or he comments, um, for demonstratives, look at the article by students and me titled Geso Dukang on uh, the narrative structure on academia, da, general, infinite, ka uh, for participant that is mentioned but longer ago. Double demonstratives are certainly not understood by me either in Iraq. So you have, a, you have some company for that tricky. Uh, yeah, that's that a no. <laughs> um, and Yenika asks, can we go back to page 23? Okay. Can you explain what the separation and glosses are? Um, oh yeah, oh great. Um, so, um, do you mean that with the, the surface form and then the underlying uh, uh, affixation? Um, because that's, uh, yeah, so the, the medial passive marker, um, I mean, Andrew can probably um, <laughs> explain this much better, but there's an interaction between those prefixes uh, which lead to that surface form. Um, yes. And, um, and I, I'm not sure about why there is um, this agent uh, prefix, um, but it seems to me that it's possibly a, a result of a grammatical constraint of a patient, patient marked auxiliary or verb always needing an agent mark as well. Yeah, this, uh, this, seems, this seems to be the case here when we have these uh, passive uh, constructions. I mean, passive might not be, a, might not be the best um, label to use here. It may, may more be, you know, that these are medio passive constructions. So we have the medio passive. And in order to indicate, in order to indicate the patient, uh, the agent and the patient are actually, the agent must be marked. Um, and I think I write a bit about this in uh, my dissertation. The, and, and obviously the auxiliary is nothing uh, unless, uh, unless the uh, patient and agent are unmarked. And this is for other forms. Uh, that doesn't happen in the, uh, the passive. Um, and Yenika um, follows up and asks, but synchronically they're not analyzed as such, right? It's just one thing. Well, again, I think uh, Andrew can, uh, can answer that much better because uh, I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about that either. Um, I, I know, for example, that if, the, uh, that if the gender is different, for example, um, then, then you'll get something different. So you can have, you can have uh, kana, for example, where the, uh, the I gender is, uh, or the I marker there is turned into an A, or it can be kuna if the patient is masculine in gender. Uh, so there's, uh, there's uh, you can definitely, I mean, they're not fossilized in any way morphologically. You can certainly get these, um, and, and Martin will, Martin will, uh, will uh, join me in, in saying this, and these forms um, that seem like they're, you know, they're very, uh, there's a lot expressed over, over a small, um, a small mm -hmm. word. Um, yeah, you get a lot of this sort of um, interesting, um, uh, fusion and uh, uh, yep. of these morphemes. So you get these very rich uh, structures to which uh, Yannicka answers, cool, okay. <laughs> That's also, of course, um, um, supported by that variable tan marking, uh, which still yep. tracks the same reference. And, uh, and Martin jumps in and says, indeed, it's not just one thing. It needs two days to explain. So <laughs> There's a lot. If you're if you're a morphologist, there's interesting things to look at there. Um, we'll do one more question from Liz. Question or comment? Uh, it sounds like the Gezo Dukang paper would be useful to help see which markers map on to which parts of Gundel et al.'s 1993's accessibility hierarchy, or how well the hierarchy fits with the data. So it's a comment on 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 this particular paper being useful. That really sounds good because that's something I. Um... I was still wondering because it's still so unclear what their base meaning is to see what, um, so yeah, I, I will definitely take a look at it. Thank you very much. Perfect.
Um, great. Um, I see that I see that uh, Martin Kosman has uh, has a comment as well, but I'll make sure that that is uh, communicated on given that we are half past now and uh, we need to move on to Yurian. Uh, so I will ask Clemens to stop sharing his screen and uh, for Yurian to start uh, sharing his. So this is Yurian's uh, presentation, the syntax of O in Gorwa. Uh, 